so we're going to kind of pick up on some of the things that we've been building upon uh, in the last couple lectures. Um, again, you want to keep sight of some of the, the causal connections or metaphysical issues as it relates to well, what is a person. Um, Heidegger, again, explicated this, this notion of Dasein, that Dasein is the, the being there, the being here of a person. That Dasein is always already in a world that we are instantiated within a referential totality of involvements and practices, the ready to hand equipment that we just take up and use without any explicit uh, you know, perceptual awareness as, as like a concept or something like that. And uh, as we'll see, uh, moods and emotions are gonna play into that whole picture in a really important way. Um, so first though, we'll just outline the conventional view which goes something like this. Emotions are seen as internal or subjective experiences resulting from the activation of a particular neurophysiological state, uh, often referred to as an affect program, and as being about or directed toward a specific object, person, or event. So emotions, in a narrow sense, are related to a specific situation or a person. Uh, it, it has a, a, an intentional component to it. It's generally believed that there are a number of basic emotions, including fear, anger, and sadness, that are culturally <coughs> universal, biologically hardwired, and presumed to have evolutionary survival value. Now, just to, again, kind of state where my biases kind of lie with some of this stuff, I think you can do the basic emotion bit, or you can do, you know, uh, an exploration into some kind of evolved material efficient mechanisms. And that's, that's kind of what uh, Jak Panksepp is doing uh, through his work, uh, or was doing through his work. So Panksepp outlines um, seven basic neuroevolutionary systems that we share with other mammals. Um, and one of the reasons that I like Panksepp though is He's not engaging in a kind of reductionist approach. Like he's studying, he makes it very clear that he's studying these neurological systems. And he's studying them firsthand through experiments with, with mice and rats and small mammals and dissecting them and, and you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, he makes it very clear that what he's not doing is, is uh, like he's not, he's not explicating like the full emotion. Like he's, he's saying that, that there's a necessary kind of fundamental structure upon which, like, and we share that structure with, with uh, other mammals, but to be human involves being, again, instantiated within like, you know, a cultural, uh, you know, period and situation. And it involves, you know, neocortex that kind of comes into play. It involves kind of self-awareness that kind of complicates, you know, what then manifests as an emotion. So even though similar systems are being activated in non-human animals, the, the end result of the experience is going to be different just because of, you know, well, how we're different neurophysiologically, uh, what is built atop those, those older systems, but also that we have this, uh, this symbolic capacity for being in a world. I'm just gonna read you just a little passage just to um, where uh, Panksepp kind of outlines the differences between his approach and, and maybe some other approaches. So he says, the neocortex is responsible for almost all of the cultural milestones that human beings have been able to achieve. And neuroscience has also provided an important message. Practically all of the psychological specializations within the cortex are learned. None has yet been empirically demonstrated to be an intrins intrinsic, evolutionarily dictated module. However, the cortex could achieve nothing without an evolved foundational mind deeper in the brain. Those ancient neural territories below the neocortex constitute our ancestral mind, the affective mind, which is evolutionarily specialized and that we share with many other animals. So that's his position. It's a position that I'm more or less on, on board with. Um, so he outlines uh, seven different systems. He, he talks about the seeking system that's involved in um, uh, wanting to explore the environment or that there's an excited sort of anticipatoriness in, in relation to encountering things in the world. Uh, he talks about the, the rage system, the fear system, 
there's a lust system involved in, in you know, sexual interest and, and whatnot. There's a grief system, a panic grief system that's uh, more kind of related to attachment behaviors and feelings of sadness and so on. There's a care system involved in uh, you know, the social connection and whatnot, and there's a play circuit. And so for him, these are the neurological kind of foundations. But what he's doing is, is something different than what uh, like a Paul Ekman is, is doing. Um, or some of the other uh, basic emotions researchers. Um, so we can contrast emotions with moods, um, or they're typically contrasted. So moods are typically regarded as having a more pervasive and sustained disposition, including hours, weeks, days, and they're more diffuse or general in their scope. Um, so they last a lot longer. Emotions tend to be short in, in duration, relatively speaking. Uh, moods don't have a, an intentional target necessarily. So we talk about just being, an, in general, in an irritable mood, right? We don't talk about uh, being, having that directed toward any, any given person necessarily. But in what sense should we consider an emotion basic as a biologically distinct system? in the way that, that Panksepp would, would consider it. A conceptually basic, functionally discrete, behaviorally recognizable. Uh, should it be basic as it's essential somehow to human life? Um, and as Robert Solomon explained or outlined in, in the paper that I had you guys read, there's several basic emotions, uh, the researchers uh, who seem to disagree on, on what a basic emotion is. They have different lists as well as different criteria according to which emotions are considered basic. So again, you have this weird uh, thing where, where different uh, conceptual communities or researchers working within those communities are apparently studying the same thing and they're, they're seeing uh, something very different. Um, and again, that's because there are different theoretical assumptions that go into you know, their interpretations. Um, if you're interested in like the, the history of how we uh, have come to think about emotions within psychology, the debate that Solomon is referencing at the end of the 90s, if you go back and read some of those papers, like they're just fascinating. Like they're, they're actually, they're psychologists who are actually getting into the weeds with some of the, the philosophical issues as it relates to what an emotion is. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty vicious kind of back and forth. I mean, if you read a lot of philosophy stuff, it's like, yeah, that's par for the course. That's just what you do. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> In psychology, this, it was a, you know, quite a nasty debate. We can wonder, you know, can the facial expression or behavior guarantee the presence or the absence of the feeling as characteristically experienced in the first person? So would we, would we always say that, I mean, we, we hear about how actors, when they're playing a part in a movie, they're like channeling, you know, from some memory or something to evoke some emotion, but is that always the case, would we say, or, or you know, is it possible that you can have you know, an emotional display behaviorally uh, without having the same kind of quality uh, as it's experienced? Can we infer from the sameness of expressions to the sameness of emotions? Does invariance or universality imply a strict neurological basis? Might it result from some part of the human condition that's maybe manifesting similarly across cultures? You know, so, I mean, we could, a straightforward example of that, I suppose, would be you know, any, any being that has the time or the luxury and, and the mental capacity through symbolic thought, uh, you know, afforded to them by language users and whatnot, like, uh, you can get to this place where you wonder, well, what, what the hell is all this for? What, what, am, what am I supposed to do? What's the meaning of life? Wait a second, I, I die? Like, and so we can argue that an emotion of, like, ex existential dread or anxiety or something like that related to our mortality could be a basic emotion. Um, you know, and, but it doesn't mean that there's like a, a neurologically kind of distinct module for that. It just means that it involves some of the basic things, but it's, it's um, uh, also built atop like all this sort of tertiary and, and neocortical stuff and, and the fact that we are self-aware beings that are capable of, of this sort of thing. So Solomon says that uh, contrary to the conventional view, there is good reason to suppose that we have never met a raw, unembellished, basic emotion, one not covered, covered over with the trappings of culture and experience and constrained 
and complicated by the display rules of our society. So each society has, you know, expectations, uh, tacit, uh, you know, understandings about what kinds of emotions are permissible to express and when and, and so on, right? And that affects arguably our experience of, of these emotions as well. So fear and anger are supposedly basic emotions, but surely what one fears and what makes one angry, as well as the display rules for expressing those emotions, depends on the society and the situation. And you can think about this as, you know, uh, just fitting together with our understanding of, of Dasein, and Dasein, again, is, is always already in a world. It's always instantiated within uh, a referential whole, a, a, you know, a, a, a totality that has some kind of intelligibility, you know, um, that there are various meanings that we appropriate, you know, to interpret our situation, whether that be just on, on a tacit sort of uh, level operating outside of our awareness, or, or we're able to kind of, you know, in a representational and intentional sense, we can, you know, take a glance at our situation from a distance. And our culture is going to, you know, constrain or, or influence that to a great degree. So in our eagerness to identify observable behaviors that can be objectively measured and researched, right, which is what psychologists are really anxious to try and do, we should be careful not to deny or minimize first-person phenomena, such as sensations, thoughts, appraisals, meanings, beliefs, desires, intentions, and so on. Emotional phenomena at their core should arguably reference the raw what it's like of experience. And just as a healthy reminder, we should not confuse the words we use to talk about emotions, uh, which involve generalized concepts and abstract labels, uh, with emotions as they're experienced. So um, this is essentially a model that um, I put together uh, based on um, Robert Solomon's take on, on well, what is an emotion? Well, for him, it, it seems to include at least five different parts. And, and we can kind of work from this model just to get a sense of the phenomena, just to get a sense of, of what we're looking at and appreciating that, that there's maybe this kind of, um, there's the need to look at this thing holistically to have an appropriate understanding of it. So every emotion has five aspects. There's the behavioral expressions that can manifest in behavioral impulses or behavioral dispositions, facial expressions, and so on. There's the neurophysiological components of that. So that would be what uh, Jak Panksepp is after, the, the affect program as it's instantiated within the nervous system. The phenomenological experience as it's, it's felt in the first person. Whatever cognitive features might be at play here, so beliefs, intentions, thoughts, like our interpretation of what's happening. And the social context, um, the embeddedness within a referential totality or a social world. Now, these are not mutually exclusive parts, right? I mean, the, the social context is going to you know, be kind of tied up in the, the cognitive features and the phenomenological experience is going to be part of you know, all of this as well. Even when we're looking at the neurophysiological affect programs, there's a researcher who is you know, embodied you know, in the task of engaging this stuff, right? So I thought we would just, uh, I think there's one more little bit there. But an emotion is a holistic phenomenon. So again, we want to account for this, this thing as a whole. Um, an exclusive emphasis on any one part may distort the phenomenon. And that's what a, a reductionistic <coughs> approach tends to do. And again, that's, that's why I think Panksepp is so interesting, because what he's doing is he's saying, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this reductionistic approach. I'm only really interested in material efficient mechanisms. That's really what I'm doing here. But I'm not engaging in, in a form of reductionism because I appreciate that whatever I'm doing over here, that's not an emotion, right? That's only a necessary component. And so he's aware of there being a, a boundary between what he's doing and um, an appreciation of the emotion as it might be experienced, as it might involve you know, cultural phenomena, as it might involve you know, higher order cognitive processes and, and all that sort of thing, right? Um, but I thought we would work, we would hang out here on this slide and we would work uh, with this model to, uh, to kind of draw out like different bits of, of what an emotion is. So if we, um, if we start with the emotion of sadness, right, and we think about, well, what is it to, what is it to be sad or what are we referring to? What is, it, what is sadness? If we start in the middle part of that circle, 
the emotion as it's, as it's experienced, right? How would you describe the, the what it's like of sadness? So you go back to all, whatever times in your life that you felt sadness and, and try to describe the, the what it's like, the raw you know, experience of sadness, like what, what kind of goes along with that? Like a sinking feeling in your stomach. Sort of like there's a, a sinking feeling or, or kind of like, uh, yeah, yeah. Like a lowness almost. What's that? Like a lowness. Like feeling alone? No, low. Low, feeling low, yes. So, so there's a, a, a weightiness, there's a, a sinking feeling. Um, and notice like when we're describing this, right? Like we're describing it metaphorically, right? Like do you mean like a sinking, like a ship sinking or something? No, we're, you know, like when we try to describe a, a, a feeling and we use these abstractions, it, it ceases to be the thing that it is, right? Like when you engage in, in abstractions, you're engaging in generalizations and you're having to kind of leave parts out, right? And so the most the concrete part of that is, is the what it's like. but but we can use our language in this clumsy way to talk about this phenomenon because we've, we've all arguably felt it. So someone who's never experienced sadness, I think they would have a, a hard time, like, what do you mean sinking? What, what are you talking about, right? Um, but what else would we say? So there's a heaviness or a sinking feeling, a feeling low. What else would we say? Yeah. Like a, a feeling kind of withdrawn, like within oneself or, or from others perhaps, or? Feeling empty, yeah. So there's, uh, so with sadness though, is a sadness and and would we describe it as an emptiness though? I'm kind of wondering about that. Maybe certain modes of depression we might describe as an emptiness, but would, would we describe sadness as emptiness, or would we describe sadness as as like a, a filling up or something? You know. Right. So there's, I think we often describe like a, a welling up with sadness or a filling up with sadness, right? Um, would we say that, that you know, oftentimes we would experience like, uh, like a, a lump in the throat, you know, and, and that we might have this, this like uh, sensation in, in our eyes, like, uh, like we can sense like um, maybe a, we might even feel or sense like the, 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 our eyes watering in a way, right? This, this impulse to cry or something, you know. If we jump over to, to the left-hand side and we say, okay, well, what, so the, the, there's this what it's like to experience sadness and we, and we put on our scientist hats and we say, okay, well, what's going on on a neurophysiological level with, with sadness? Um, does anyone know any of that, by the way? Well, so according to, go ahead. Uh, like, uh, GABA is, yeah. So GABA is, is a, like a, a general inhibitory, yeah. uh, but as it's working within like, um, so, um, Panksepp would say that in sadness, it's, um, it's working with the grief system, uh, the, the kind of the panic grief system. And for him, that involves, um, well, it involves the, the dorsal medial thalamus. It involves the periaqueductal gray, the anterior cingulate. It involves uh, a down regulation of um, endogenous opiates. Um, and it, it uh, causes the release of uh, corticotropin releasing factor, CRF, which is part of the stress response, um, and, uh, and glutamate, actually, which is uh, one of the excitatory, right? But as it's operating within that system, that, that seems to be what's, what's going on there, um, according to Panksepp, right? I'm going to take his word for it. Um, so. I mean, we don't need to get into the specifics of that, but, but so we can, again, we're just showing that we can do like a neurophysiological account of whatever's going on within the nervous system at that time. So if we, so then we jump up to behavior and we say, well, what's happening on a behavior level? So I guess if we were to take like an extrospective stance and we, we kind of observe someone who is uh, apparently sad, like what will we notice or what will we, describe in terms of their behavior. Are they physically isolating themselves from others? Physically isolating, yeah. So they're, you know, maybe withdrawn or something like that. Is, I wonder though, is that, is that always the case? Depends on like kind of where your basis is. Mm -hmm. Maybe the social context, like where you're at. Like, so if you're feeling sad and, and you have like a best friend or a parent nearby in the, in the vicinity, like you might not withdraw. If you're in a work setting and, and you know, you're not getting along with anyone and you know, 
um, maybe you might withdraw or kind of pull away. Uh, what other kinds of behaviors would we see in sadness? Right. We'd probably see crying or tears or eyes welling up or something like that. What else? What is, what is the body doing like as a whole in sadness? Yep. It slouches. Kind of like a, a slouching. So when we talk about this sinking, right, this heaviness, like we can see that manifesting uh, behaviorally too, right? And sadness. Um, so then we say, okay, what's, what's going on cognitively? You know, what's going on in terms of, or what we, you know, maybe suspect or hypothesize in terms of how an individual is, is interpreting the situation in sadness, or what could be involved in that? Well, I, let me, just in general, I think you could say, well, there's, there's a sadness. You can have a sadness for someone, can't you? Right, that you're talking with someone, especially someone that you care about, and they're going through some god-awful situation, and, and you're feeling sad. You feel sad for them. Or you're watching a movie, and um, you know, the protagonist is going through this awful, terrible thing, and, and you, you kind of feel yourself welling up in tears, and it's sadness for what, what this character is experiencing. Right? So you can experience a sadness for uh, someone. You can experience a sadness as it relates to you. right? Uh, the, the things that you're having to in, endure or, um, you know, things that have happened to you. Um, and then I suppose you could, in a more detached way, you can be, well, I'm, I'm kind of sad in, in general, like this whole story or narrative or something is, is like tragic or something. In some detached way, you could feel like some minimal sense of sadness or something. But then, you know, there's also the, the um, what the sadness is about, well, it's, it's about the fact that, you know, I wanted to go on this trip with you and you told me that I couldn't come and you invited someone else and I feel really left out and it makes me feel sad or something like that, right? So it's tied up in, in various meanings as it relates to uh, arguably the, the, the person's life. What about um, uh, just more broadly, uh, how this person, how a given individual is instantiated within the world, like within a community, um, within uh, familiar practices, like how will some of those things uh, influence the expression of sadness? Yep. Uh, well, culturally, like... Well, I, I, so we would agree, I think, that, that there are some cultures, there are some... Um, environments, there are some family dynamics even, right, where it's quite permissible to experience sadness. It's something that, that you know, people welcome or that it's, uh, you know. So different communities, I guess, can have like um, different ways of, of being or different understandings of, of how to interpret their situation. That may relate to moods and emotions, right? So, um, you know, you think about, uh, you know, people who, who grew up on the south shore of Nova Scotia, right? And, you know, if you just, if, if you know anyone who has grown up in, in the South Shore, especially like someone who's a, a bit older, maybe things are maybe changing a little bit. But if, if you ask like, okay, so someone who grew up uh, there in those kinds of communities, communities that, you know, are based on like, like a kind of a hardened life kind of fishing tradition, like just kind of doing what you need to do to get by and, and there maybe isn't the luxury or time to kind of sit and, and kind of attend to feelings and, and so on. Um, like, these are communities where people, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not as acceptable, I guess, to express a feeling. And it, it arguably leads to a situation where a person is not, maybe not even aware that they're feeling something like sadness. So just as an example, like, it's, it's pretty common that, uh, you know, in, in a therapy setting, if, if you're working with someone who comes from a community like that and you ask them about their experiences and so on and, and uh, you're, you're inviting them to engage with, with what you presume would, would be like some kind of vulnerable, distressing feeling of some sort, and then they will kind of maybe spontaneously say, well, it's not like I'm going to cry here, you know, and well, why not? What would be so terrible about that if, if you need to? Um, well, well that, that would make me weak, wouldn't it? You know, okay. Where'd you learn that from, you know? Um, and I, I mean, people do learn this. They learn this sort of intuitively. That's the intuitive sense, is, is that vulnerability in, in certain cultures or communities is, is a, a sign of weakness or something. Um, 
you know, so that's, that's uh, sadness, for example. We can also work, you know, really quickly with something like anger, right? Uh, what is the what it's like to feel anger? How does anger feel experientially? You guys never felt anger before? What, what does it feel like to, to, uh, to feel anger in your body? Like, what does that feel like? Feeling warm or like a loss of control almost. Okay, so there's a, a feeling of warmth. Where do you feel that warmth? Do you feel it in your hands and feet? Like in the pit of my stomach, I find. In, in the stomach? Yeah, does it move or does it just kind of stay there like a heat, like right here? Does it have any movement to it? It kind of builds. And where does it build? What direction does it build? Upward, Upward like it's a, a, a heat that kind of moves through your body. What else would we say about the what it's like of anger, what anger feels like in the body? We can say that there's an irritability somewhere in, in there, maybe? Um, is, is there like, uh, do we say that, that, that there's a warmth to it? What else would we say, though, in terms of, yeah? Tension? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think, see, this is where it gets really interesting, right? Because there, there are like various experiences that can show up that uh, that maybe don't perfectly align with with the the feeling as it's sort of uncomplicated in some way. So an uncomplicated anger, I would say, like if you're actually in the experience in your body of anger, it is like a warmth that kind of moves through your body. It has a dynamic force. There's a power to it. It's not like a see tension kind of. Uh, it, it rigidifies or it, it closes up in a way, it tightens up. Anger is like an expansiveness, right? Anger wants to move outward. And there's this dynamic energy to it. Uh, there's a power behind it. Um, so, I mean, we'll get into some of the other stuff uh, maybe in a minute. But so we go over to neurophysiological level. And uh, I think, again, from Panksepp's model, um, the amygdala is, is pretty important in that. Um, as well as parts of the thalamus. Again, the, the paraqueductal gray is important in that. Testosterone, uh, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, like all this kind of stuff is, is part of that system as uh, outlined by Panksepp. Uh, if we go to the behavior, I mean, that's pretty obvious. What do we see behaviorally in, in people who are, are angry? What do we say in, in their faces? How do their faces seem to, to be? How can we tell that someone ex is experiencing anger? So it kind of got, got like, so anger kind of sees with a squint, doesn't it, right? There's like a, a focal, like uh, honing in on, on the target of the anger. What else is happening? Sometimes you get like reddening of the face or something like that. Possibly a reddening of, of the face. Um, yeah. And I mean, if, if someone's really out of control, what, what do you see behaviorally? Yelling, Yelling punching, kicking, clawing, like a lashing out of, of some kind, right? Um, cognitively, what's going on in anger? So how is, is, you know, where is a person in their thoughts or what's happening in, in their interpretation that goes along with anger? I feel like your brain just kind of like shuts off almost. It's like you don't really like think that much. And you're just like, you're just like, oh, you know, you're just like so like tense. Well, how would we differentiate frustration from anger? Well, I think, I, I think I would want to say maybe that frustration is, it doesn't have a direction. It's like, um, it's not directed to, toward typically like, uh, like an entity or a person, you know, like, I mean, you can be frustrated in not being able to, to figure out, you know, a crossword puzzle or solve a Rubik's cube, right? But, but I don't think you'd say that you're angry at, at the, there's not a direction to it in a way. Or you can be frustrated in general and, you know, and it not be kind of directed anywhere. Now, someone else can frustrate you, and then you can say, well, well what do I feel of, uh, with this person that, that, that they're frustrating me? And then you can say, well, that's anger. Um, so anger seems to have a, a direction. Um, you know, a person may have in their thoughts, like, well, how dare this person? I don't deserve this. You know, like, you're, you know, a horrible individual that you would engage in such and such. Um, so this is some of the cognitive stuff that might be at play. Yeah, 
Um, I think I would still want to differentiate, like when you're working therapeutically with someone, right? Like, and you might just be, be thinking in terms of like, okay, so at, I, I know what it's like to be really, really pissed at someone, like I want to track them down and clock them and, and throttle them, right? Um, but I also know what it's like to, to have a lesser version of that where I just want to go and tell them off. And I also have a lesser version of that where I just think angry thoughts in my head and that seems to, and right? So I understand like, like that, there's gradations in that way, but I think I would also want to differentiate like a, a, a frustrated disposition uh, that doesn't seem to have a direction. It's like when you work therapeutically with, with people around some of this stuff, like people have a really hard time expressing anger they can almost get to a point of frustration, but it's almost like they can't comprehend that there was someone that caused the frustration, right? So they can't, they can't direct it in a way, you know? So I think there is a, an important difference there with that. Yeah? So we can get into just a little sidebar conversation. Like, you know, so part of it is, is like, okay, what about people who have like anger management problems, this sort of thing, right? So they, they have uh, like impulse control problems or something. Um, you know, where they engage in, in this, uh, you know, aggressive kind of behavior and, and act out on it. And then, you know, maybe they feel terrible about it afterward or, you know, like how do you interpret that sort of thing? Well, I think it, an important concept to uh, keep in mind, might as well kind of talk about it here, um, is uh, emotion regulation, right? So emotion regulation is, is not that you're getting really good at managing your emotions. That's not really what it means. It, it means, I think, in more of a... Um, a phenomenological or, or a, a, a dynamic psycho psychological sense, it means that you're able to tolerate a feeling, like you can have that feeling manifest and show up in your body, uh, and you can hang out there in that feeling and carry that feeling without being overwhelmed by the feeling, where it just spills over into action, or without having to psychologically detach from the experience. Uh, to disengage somehow from it, right? So emotion regulation is, is kind of that middle path in being able to, uh, to navigate that. Does that make sense? Um, and then, you know, of course, we can kind of tie this up with the, the socially situated uh, context, like obviously some cultures, communities, uh, family dynamics, anger, it can be permissible or anger can be something that you're going to get shamed for. And, and people who grow up in those kinds of environments, again, they have a very difficult time often um, experiencing anger. And, and why is that important? You know, well, if you can't feel anger in your body, and anger in your body is not to be uh, mistaken for being aggressive or being violent, right? That's not what we're talking about. If you can't feel anger in your body, it makes it very difficult for you to assert yourself with people. You know, so you have to carry a little bit of that feeling just to even be able to kind of look at someone in the eyes and, and kind of stand your ground and assert yourself. You know, so if you don't have that feeling, people who can't get connected with that feeling, they, they often find themselves in situations where they're you know, chronically uh, anxious or they avoid conflict, right? Um, and they end up in social dynamics where they get you know, taken advantage of, unfortunately. So. Um, we're going to move along here. So the biological affect programs might be conceptualized as a kind of proto-emotion, as a necessary and perhaps universal condition, but one that is nonetheless insufficient for bringing about the emotion proper as it's uh, phenomenally experienced. And again, that would be in line, I think, with uh, Panksepp's approach. According to Solomon, all emotions have a neurobiological basis, but the identity of particular emotions lies elsewhere in their phenomenological structures. Now we're going to more explicitly kind of uh, tie some of this to uh, Martin Heidegger's work and uh, the being in the world, and, and we'll talk about mood more generally. So when he's using the term mood, um, he's using it very broadly, like he's, he's not really distinguishing mood and emotions, like it's, it's this sort of... Um, it, it's this, uh, I guess, a, a catch term that includes a, a lot of uh, disparate phenomena. Uh, but we'll, we'll get a sense of, of what that means as we're moving along here. So it's the disclosure of the there. It's, it's what uh, we talked about thrownness, right? So Dasein is, is thrown into the world, thrown into a situation. And what he's going to say is that we are thrown into our, our moods, our, our dispositions, our ways of, we find ourselves in, in various moods. But first, so 
So mood is a, is a particular, so moods in, you know, in the plural are particular ways that, of finding yourself, right? But they're, they are the, the modes, right? And we talked about from a phenomenological perspective, you have the existentials, which are the, the existential structures that are involved in, in, in Dasein. Uh, you know, if you're a human being, then you have these basic existential structures. And then you have particular ways that, that those things manifest. And one of the basic existential structures related to this is called Befindlichkeit. And that's roughly translated into so foundedness or how one finds oneself. Um, various translators will also kind of, you know, use the terms uh, attunement or state of mind. Uh, state of mind is, I think, universally regarded as a bad translation because, again, it, it suggests that there's this internal representational mind stuff going on, and that's exactly the opposite of what Heidegger's wanting to emphasize. Um, I prefer the one uh, uh, called situatedness. Uh, it's, it lets you know kind of how you're situated in, in the world, in a way. So it's part of the existential structure of Dasein such that it always finds itself already in a situation and way of being attuned to the world where things and ways of acting are disclosed as mattering. So again, moods are just, you know, particular ways that, that through these existential structures, the, the structure of situatedness, uh, our, our, our sort of disposition is revealed to us. So a mood is not something inside of us. We say that we are in a mood, not that a mood is something experienced in us. So we are, we are not in the mood to go to the party or we're not in the mood to, you know, pay attention to this class or, you know, whatever it might be. We seldom think our way into a mood. This is more of an active conceptualization, like a, a self-aware, contemplative, you know, representational in, in, intentionality sort of um, way of conceptualizing this. Rather, we find ourselves in a mood, which is, uh, again, slightly more passive. Moods are prior to cognition. They provide the background for both intentionality and cognition. So you can think of you are always in some mood or another. And moods serve as, as the ground or the soil from which you know, the, the, the tree and roots of, of thought emerge in a way. So in a previous class, there were questions about, well, we talked about the, the cognitive behavioral approach and the idea that, that cognition much of the time frames our, our reality and kind of you know, funnels our interpretation such that we find ourselves in a given emotion. Well, what's an, what's an alternative approach or an alternative way of doing therapy? Well, to appreciate that, that moods and emotions in and of themselves say a lot about the way that the person is in the world. And you know, in a way, you almost have to understand that on its own, or as possibly emerging prior to cognition. Um, yeah? And like, can you like talk yourself out of a mood? Oh, absolutely. Well, well, to a certain degree. Uh, certain situations, certain yeah. moods, right? Um, or say you're really sad that day and you're like, you know what, it's actually a pretty good day. Like, yeah. You know. Yeah, but the point is, is that um, um, much of the time, like, and even when you talk yourself out of a mood, like you're not, you're not ta talking yourself out of a mood, right? You're just talking yourself into a different mood, arguably, right? Well, this is a position that Heider would take. We're always in a mood of some sort, right? I'll get to this, I think, in the next, next little bit. So Dasein perpetually finds itself always already in some mood. The most powerful moods are those that we do not at all attend to and examine even less, these moods that attune us as if there were no moods there at all. So even just a, a mood of you know, mild interest or a mood of just a, a subtle apprehension, right? If, if you were not in a mood in, in any way, like if you were not dialed in kind of experientially in some way, like nothing would really solicit your attention, like nothing would, would show up as, as meaning anything or mattering in, in any way. Um, so when he's talking about moods, like he's talking about like a very broad class of, of phenomena. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So even in our attempts to dislodge ourselves from a particular mood, we successfully do so only by cultivating some counter mood. 
people encounter the world differently depending on mood, like how a radio antenna can be attuned to different frequencies or stations. So this is a, a nice little metaphor to kind of use if, if it kind of works for you. It's, it's like your mood like discloses the world in a particular way. It's like how you're kind of dialed into the world, like how you're kind of tuned, tuned up uh, in, in, in ways that um, allow you to respond to various affordances uh, in your environment and to people in, in particular ways. Our attunement can turn us toward an openness to the world being disclosed or being closed off from it. Openness to the world or being closed off from it as it's often the case in bad moods such as annoyance and boredom. So in a state of annoyance, right, we're often in this, this irritable disposition that closes us off in some ways to uh, connecting with someone in, in a more intimate way. We almost want to kind of keep someone at a bit of an arm's length. It prevents us from being able to, you know, experience other kinds of phenomena as we're kind of focused on the object of our annoyance or something maybe. Um, and boredom, you know, boredom closes us off from, you know, just being caught up in, you know, something of interest, something that engages us, something that um, you know, solicits us to, to act. You know, we find ourselves kind of crippled in, in this bored uh, mood. Moods serve as a structural background that makes specific emotions possible, and emotions have greater intentional specification, again, directed toward a specific object, person, or situation. So you can think about moods as just a, a broad kind of way of, of being in the world, uh, being attuned or dialed into the world and emotions are, are kind of more specific. They're, they're based on, on that, uh, the, the background mood. Moods disclose the world. They provide the background on the basis of which we encounter things, people, and situations as mattering or not, as the case may be, in some specific way. So the mood of fear allows us to encounter people and things as threatening or scary. If we did not have moods, there would just be pure theoretical beholding. It would be like this Cartesian sort of detached existence or something like that. Um, and nothing could show up as meaningful or mattering. We would find ourselves in this sort of nihilistic state, uh, like you'd just be crippled and, and just wouldn't have any impulse to really do much of anything. Uh, this is a, a quote from Dreyfus, Hubert Dreyfus. Cognitivists like Ekman end up decontextualizing emotions in the search for objective features, so display rules and so on. Mattering is left out altogether and cannot be reconstructed from such impoverished elements. So part of understanding uh, a mood or disposition is seeing how it kind of ties in to like the individual's uh, goals or purposes or their self-interpretation what matters to them, you know? So if you want to understand, you know, why, you know, a young man is, is depressed and, you know, I mean, if you engage in a conversation with this person and you ask, well, how, how long have you been suffering? How long has this been an issue for you? And they say, well, you know, maybe two years. Well, and what was, were there significant events or something like that that happened two years ago? And they say, well, yeah, I, I broke my hand. Well, what was significant about that for you? Well, I'm, I'm a pianist, I'm a piano player. Like, that was my whole life, that was my world, and I broke my hand, it's just not, it's not functioning in the way that it did. I can't play in the way that, that I, I did before, and it was devastating, it was just world-destroying for me. And so, you're not gonna be able to understand something like that unless you, you know, see the, the contextualized individual and, and how these, you know, how they, they are instantiated in the world and what matters to them and, and why. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to kind of talk a little bit about depression. Um, one of the interesting things, so I've been in clinical practice full time for 10 or 11 years now. And uh, in the last five or six years, I've noticed like just a dramatic shift in people's willingness to talk about mental health and, and illness. Um, which is pretty amazing. Like it's a it's a huge huge shift. You know, there's there's not nearly as much, you know, shame or, or stigma as it relates to, you know, having a, a mental health issue or problem or you know seeking out help. 
but I, I also noticed that there's a peculiar way that, that people often talk about mental illness. And uh, this is particularly obvious with my adolescent clients, and I often ask people like, okay, so outside of our sessions, like who do you have as a support? Like who do you talk to? Uh, do, do they know that you're coming here? Do you talk about the things that, that we get into in the sessions? Um, and oftentimes what, what you get or, or the sense, you know, is that the teens will talk about, you know, their issues, but they'll talk about them in the way like they'll say, well, well yeah, I, I have depression. I told them that I have depression. And, and what's interesting is they told me that they have anxiety. You know, and, and they know someone who has depression. So in a way, like we, we kind of get it or something like that. And so they talk about having depression. But it's interesting to think about, well, what does it mean to have depression? You know, uh, in a sense, doesn't it kind of mean that like I, I, I meet criteria for this diagnostic label or something, right? It's like I, I have the diagnosis, you know? And so in that sense, having depression is kind of like having a driver's license, you know? And so you're just referencing this, this label, but you're not really getting into the thick of it of, of what that truly means, you know? So I don't think you can have depression. And why is that? Because I don't think there, there's, there's not enough separation between the, the having and the thing that is supposedly had, right? Like to have, like, I think, you are depressed, like it's a way of being, like it, it alters your sense of existing in the world, it alters how you come to understand yourself, it, it potentially alters you know, your experience of time, it alters your you know, receptivity to, to various kinds of emotions, like it is such a pervasive way of existing in the world. Like you can't get enough distance from it for it to be something that you could just merely have, right? Um, yeah, do you have a comment? Yeah, I was wondering, like, do you think the having is kind of a habit, like it's kind of put onto you? Yeah. Uh, I think there's a number of different things going on. Uh, I, think, I think part of it is to say that I have depression. It's like you're referring to this thing at a distance and you're inviting someone to engage with you at a distance around this thing, but you're not really kind of like, so what, what would the alternative be? Well, the alternative would be like, well, look, you know, like, how are you doing with this depression thing? Oh man, I had a really rough day. You know, I, I just, I sat on the edge of my bed and I just stared at the wall for 45 minutes and it took me absolutely everything to just stand up, you know? Or I, I went to this party and, you know, there was like 20 of my friends there and everyone was happy or whatever and I couldn't feel more alone, you know? These are the conversations that, that people, I think it'd be great if we could have them, but I think people, um, it doesn't feel comfortable to have them or they don't, they don't know that it would be good to have them or, um, or it's threatening maybe to, to have them, you know? So again, like de depression is arguably like a, a mood or disposition, you know, that you find yourself in. Uh, it's something that is, you know, it, it just, colors your, your whole world, your way of being, um, and it's not something that, that you can have just at, at a distance. Um, now, this isn't, you know, the way that I'm talking about it. This, this really isn't how, how, you know, in the mainstream we, we talk about this sort of thing. Um, you know, oftentimes we, we talk about mental illness as it being a brain disorder. Um, and you might say, well, that's, that's maybe you know, a, a small minority of individuals that, ha that take that view. No, this is actually uh, from uh, teenmentalhealth.org. This is uh, uh, Stan Kutcher, the psychiatrist at Dalhousie. Um, he has put a big push in the last decade or so on mental health literacy, right? So he's um, coming from a good place, I presume, and is you know, noticing how we have all this literature as it relates to physical health and, and why don't we kind of teach people about mental health. Um, so he has created these programs, so we're, we're now introducing this into the classroom and, and this is what students are, are being taught, that, that mental illness is a brain disorder, it's, function, it's a, a problem with the nervous system, that's, that's the interpretation or how you, you might understand it. Um, now, can anyone see any potential problems with that? 
you know, like, yep. I suggest that's like, it maybe isn't curable if you can't really do anything about it. Well, yeah, maybe suggest that, that there's nothing that you can do about it. The best that you can do is, is maybe manage it really well, you know, so we're going to go to like some mental health technicians that are going to give you breathing techniques or kind of, you know, thought exercises or homework that will help you kind of alleviate the severity of the symptom, but you're kind of stuck with it in a way, perhaps, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like um, Bionica's brain disorder, like physically, a brain disorder shifts it more to that material efficient causality. That's right. Taking away the agency that we all, we all have in it, like, and it kind of leads to trying to treat it with just drugs instead of just um, talking it through or finding social supports, those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it potentially limits the options in, in some way. Well, in understanding i mean it's interesting too because if it's a brain disorder then then you know and when i'm thinking about just to be clear right we're talking about special cases and whatnot <laughs> I, I wouldn't deny that there are perhaps mental illnesses that are biologically based and that's the proper way to interpret it what i'm questioning is the most common kinds of mental illnesses such as anxiety depression um you know ptsd like this kind of thing right um so it possibly closes off uh, an appropriate understanding of of your situation and why you are this way, right? If if you um, if you are led to believe that there's there's nothing that was happening in your life or or your understanding of yourself or the meanings that are important to you, like none of that is is important in terms of understanding this. It's to be understood at the level of material efficient kind of neurological processes. Then again, it closes off options. I think in in terms of understanding your situation and the help that you might get. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say is, is that if it was like, if depression or anxiety was, was something that involved like a, a necessary and sufficient kind of neural malfunction or something, you would think that, that by now they would have come up with some kind of test or something that can reliably distinguish between someone who's depressed or someone who's not. And to my knowledge, they still haven't done that. They're searching for it. They're spending millions and millions of dollars on this. Um, but as far as I can tell, like, I, it seems to me like it's a, a waste of time in a way. Even if there was some necessary neural component to this, arguably that's, that's, that's not getting at the whole of, of the phenomena. That's not getting at the whole of what it is to be depressed or what it is to experience a, you know, generalized anxiety or something. Um, I'm an optimist, you know, and well, I'll put it to you this way, like, um, well, and there, there, I, I have biases on, on some of these things. Biases aren't a bad thing as long as you're aware of what they are and why you have them, right? And so when I work with people clinically, I'm always operating on the assumption that I can help this person and they can help themselves, right? Um, I've never, like, is it possible that someone could be so... Um, like so stuck in, in like this sort of emotional mood-based disposition or way of being or something that's like a neurological condition or something and the only way that we can help them is through ECT or you know some kind of invasive you know is that is that the case I'm sure it happens sometimes um, I don't think I've ever seen it in the 10 or 11 years that I've been doing this full time. And depression, anxiety is my bread and butter. That's what I do. It doesn't mean that I can help everyone every time. I think in hindsight, I've, I've realized that some of the really tough cases that I've run into, I've realized in hindsight, like, oh, I, I know now what I probably should have been doing with that person. And, and my God, I wish I had a time machine. I could go back and re-engage with some of this stuff. But. Oh, it's a huge part. Like, I would say that, that the overwhelming majority of mental health issues are all problems of emotion regulation, effectively, right? Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk about what some of that might look like. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of funny ways of, of problematizing, I guess, like some of this, you know, a mental illness is a brain condition or something like that. I mean, you can tweak, like, there's a Wittgensteinian kind of thought experiment where... Let's, let's say that you have someone who's, who's like severely depressed 
and you know you have them uh, you stick them in an fMRI machine, and so they're looking at their nervous system in real time, right? And let's say, for argument's sake, that there is a material efficient kind of necessary neurological process that is, um, is able to reliably distinguish, you know, depressed from non-depressed clients, uh, patients. And so you have this person who's depressed in the fMRI. They're looking at, you know, their nervous system, and, and it's pointed out to them where the depression is apparently in the nervous system, right? And then we ask the question, well, you know, is, is that the depression? Is the depression, you know, the, you know, what lights up in the nervous system? Like, are we seeing two things or, we, or is there one thing happening here, right? That there's, there's a, a depressed individual who's experiencing this way of being in the world and then they're looking at, at their nervous system. I think the right, the right conclusion is that you're looking at a correlation, you know, that the genuine phenomena, the what it's like to, to be in this way or whatever, like you're looking at the necessary uh, neurological conditions, but, but it's, a, it's a matter of correlation. Are we not misunderstanding the phenomena by, by perhaps reducing it to a material efficient causal process? And that seems to be the case in, in what's happening here. I know why they're doing it. I suspect I know why, right? They're, they're doing it so, you know, I think the idea is that if we can turn mental illnesses into some physiological condition, then we don't have to stigmatize these individuals. It's not your fault and it's real, right? It's real in, in you know, some material efficient kind of sense, right? Um, in a way, I mean, that's kind of sad. It's like, so, so what? Like, meanings aren't real, like, like the first person experience is not real, like of course that's real. Um, and, uh, and again, if, if we cut the person off from any interpretation that, uh, that would help them authentically understand their situation, then you know, maybe it funnels them into you know, drugs or, or just mere coping. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand out the reflection papers. Uh, we'll do that for today, and then we'll call it a day. Okay.